Hi, I'm Dr. Van der Vakorska, and this is Inequality Bites. There's poetry redefined, fathers from the left behind, novels of a different kind, need to make a state of mind. Look how master minds are getting sent down to mind. Take a look at our strengths all combined. This is Inequality Bites, the podcast where we discuss how we can make society more equal so that everyone can flourish. In this series, we'll speak not only to experts on a range of different inequalities, but vitally also to those at the sharp end of inequality. Inequality Bites is created by the Equality Trust, the charity working to improve quality of life in the UK by reducing social and economic inequality, because more equal societies are better for us all. Today, we're going to be talking to Sophia Moreau. Sophia is a multi-award winning policy reformist. She currently runs the Public Affairs and Policy Department at the Small Charities Coalition, an organisation that the Equality Trust is proud to be part of, representing 91% of the charity sector. After experiencing gender, race and disability discrimination, Sophia Moreau took legal action without a lawyer. As a result of her experiences, she now mentors other victims of discrimination as an employment tribunal consultant. She also volunteers as head of education at the charity Pregnant Then Screwed, a charity working to end the motherhood penalty in work, education and training. In her spare time, she works as a freelance opinion writer and investigative journalist, with clients including the BBC and iNews. After being refused a pay rise, she discovered that a white male colleague was being paid over £3,000 more than her. And she joins me today to speak about this formative experience. So hi, Sophia, and welcome to Inequality Bites. And thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Could you share with our listeners a little bit about your background and how and where you grew up? So I was born and raised in South London in Croydon. Um, I was quite lucky to have had a um, thriving civil sector in Croydon. So I was involved in um, equality and diversity advocacy from about the age of 16. It was my first job ever. Um, So I had the unique experience, I suppose, of having researched and worked as an equality and diversity advocate before I had my first experiences of workplace discrimination in a sense. So I myself was a care leaver and I had lots of formative experiences in that sense as well. And I noticed the underrepresentation in the charity sector, which I now work in, in terms of people with lived experiences of the issues that they work on. Um, so I've been trying to work to address this. Um, I now work as um, a trainer on trustee boards to try and diversify charity boards and the like. So I'd say the running thread in my background thus far is um, a passion for equality and social change. And when did you first notice that inequality existed? What was it that really sort of piqued your interest? It's hard to pinpoint a specific moment, to be honest. It's sort of like a mosaic of experiences and things that you've witnessed. Um, I often find that it will be in hindsight that I recognise inequality and things that I interpreted as mysteries or just puzzles will later turn out to be actually that was systemic discrimination and inequality. It can be as small as, so I was a young carer, for example, and realising all the places that my grandmother, who was disabled, could not access physically and just kind of having accepted that as life, but as very, very limiting as well. And growing up to understand and also realising that I was disabled myself and understanding that that's actually not acceptable and it's not necessary and life should be accessible. It's the lack of access that is what disables you, not your impairment itself. So I'd say um, in terms of the first big experience for me as an individual, the one that is probably going to hit first would probably be in terms of the pay inequality that I experienced. So I'd been working for a few years at that point, but I was about 19 years old and I was working in an officer role in the, um, in a county council in the government. And it was advertised with a pay scale, as jobs often are. I um, had about two years of relevant experience at that point um, in similar roles, but I was offered at the lowest end of a pay scale. And I was told that it was due to my experience and that that was just standard Um, A few weeks into the role, I actually found out that a white male colleague who was around the same age as me and actually had less relevant experience and fewer responsibilities was being paid roughly three grand more a year. So for reference, our job specs were identical. I just had a more specialised remit that actually had more complex clients. So there was no practical um, justification for this disparity. And At the time, of course, even though I had been doing some equality related work at that point, I didn't yet have the personal confidence to call a problem by its name, which was discrimination. So I tried to actually raise the point after having kind of sat with it for a few days after he mentioned casually what he was paid during our lunch break. And then I decided to raise it first with um, the recruiter for my role, whom I was still in contact with, because I understood that they had recruited him as well. And they spitballed different ideas, including perhaps it's because of your age or his role is slightly different to yours, not realising that his is different in a way that actually warrants less pay, not more. 
So, yes, I suppose realising that there was no excuse for what happened was probably my first in-your-face example of discrimination, although I had observed countless more beforehand. And I think that's a really important point to make, isn't it? That, you know, discrimination is not just about those obvious things and those obvious bits of racism or sexism or disabilism. It's about how the culture around us and society is treating us. And sometimes it can take us a while to realise that what we're experiencing is discrimination or the result of systemic inequalities. That must have been really you know, galling to find out that you were more qualified, you were doing a more complex role, and he was being paid more. What was your gut reaction, first of all? My gut reaction was initially, and I suppose this might be the effects of gaslighting or being made to think that you must first question your own experiences. But I was confused initially. And I tried to find like, I suppose if I went through the mental steps, I tried to find explanations so that I thought I was preparing myself for what might be said to me. But in reality, I think I was questioning my own experience before I could digest it as something wrong that had happened. And then as soon as I'd done that, I just felt so furious. (laughs) And I just wanted to see if it could be put right. I didn't initially want to leave or kick up a fuss. I just wanted it to be put right. And I thought, I'm sure if I point this out to them, they're going to correct it. Oh, perhaps there's been some mistake. Of course, that wasn't, it didn't turn out to be the case, but that was my initial thought. And I think that happens to so many of us. We look to ourselves for the explanations, don't we, first, before we then get very angry about this and decide, you know, this is not right. We must say something about it or do something about it. That's certainly the way I felt when I was subjected to pregnancy discrimination. So then what steps did you take next? So first, I informally raised it. Um, I, I received all those different explanations from the recruiter, which in hindsight, I think that they were just brainstorming. They hadn't actually gone and asked what the reason was. Then I waited about a week, did not hear an update. Then I emailed and chased it up. I received a phone call in response. They seemed to be avoiding writing. Again, something I noticed in hindsight, not at the time. Then I was told over the phone, yeah, we asked your manager then, and he said no in terms of a pay rise. We can ask him again this week. And I didn't even realize that they'd already spoken to him. So then I decided to raise it directly with him. He then raised all sorts of explanations or excuses, rather, including that my role was short term, subject to renewal, but it was a short term role. Therefore, it did not justify the higher end of the pay scale. Again, why did they advertise as a pay scale if they weren't willing to pay on the higher end? It was a role that did not ask for more than two years experience. And I met both the essential and the desirable criteria. So it wasn't a matter of me falling short of it. I remember that the I went back to the recruitment agent um, because, again, I think they'd recruited most of the people in my team and we had more of a rapport. And then she mentioned what the minimum wage was for my age because I was below 21. And I was like, but it's not a minimum wage job, so I don't even see what the relevance for that is. But in hindsight, again, I think they were trying to say, like, be appreciative because it could be much worse. And then I was just at this point frustrated and also fatigued. So my next step was then to resign, something that I could only really have done at that time because I didn't really have dependents or responsibilities that were of a great scale financially. And I had like a lot of pride and righteous indignation. So I just left and resigned. It's probably not the same thing that I would have done today or it's not what I've done in the instances of of discrimination that I've had in the workplace since, which there have been many. But um, that's what felt right to me at the time because I just saw that they did not want to change. And I think that happens to so many people, doesn't it, in that situation that you realise you're coming up against a brick wall and either don't have the, you know, in my case, I didn't have the confidence to challenge it or you decide that it's time to leave. And that way, so many organisations lose so much talent and, you know, so much dedication. And what did this experience at, you know, a relatively early age really show you about how society and the labour market views women and particularly women of colour? So I'd say that... It in a way set the tone. It sounds quite dark when I say that, but having had that experience prepared me for future events. Um, But it did show me that no matter what objective evidence I brought to them, like the job spec, like my experiences, like his experience, like what he was being paid and what I was being paid, it didn't really affect the consequence or the outcome, which was quite like a disempowering feeling because I always thought that if you're equipped with your knowledge of your rights and such, and you show them where they've gone wrong, then they'll try and put it right because it's not a good reflection on them and it's probably not their intention. But of course, that wasn't really the case. And it just, 
it opened my eyes because I knew of things like discrimination, inequality, etc. But having a practical example of something so unfair that wasn't corrected or addressed, it just helped me understand just how it happens on an everyday level. And I think, you know, there'll be lots of listeners nodding along there, you know, in sympathy and empathy, having been through similar things. And I think, you know, I certainly wish that you know, it's a case of if I knew now what I knew then, I would have done things differently in my case. But do you think you would go back and do anything differently if you could from that particular experience? Yes, I would. So at the time I did resign because I thought they won't change and the effort it would take for them to change will far exceed any paid hours I have in this job. Um, But knowing what I know now and having had the subsequent experiences that I've had, I now see through my present eyes that I had a clear cut case of unequal pay and I should have really taken that. I should have joined a union for one. I should have taken that to a lawyer um, and I should have stayed and challenged it, even if it was an unhealthy environment and like simply because it's unjust. And also it was public sector. So that has, I feel, an additional layer of responsibility. And the nature of the work that I was doing was dealing with people who had protected characteristics as well. Um, So I feel that I used the fact that I didn't have financial responsibilities and such as a reason why it was okay for me to resign. And I I wouldn't fault anyone in that position who did resign. It's never a bad thing to choose to save yourself and you shouldn't sacrifice yourself in order to correct their wrong. But that also meant, because in the times that I've challenged it since, I have had caring responsibilities. I have had a child while I've been um, litigating on these issues. So at the time, I actually had the freedom of, having the space to challenge it. And I wish I'd seen that. So I don't regret what I did and I wouldn't fault someone for doing that, but I would approach it differently with present knowledge. I think that's absolutely right. And I think, you know, we do, we grow in confidence. We know more about our rights and our knowledge and our support systems. And, you know, I think the levels at which we'll accept things um, increase as we get older, don't they really? But it's, it's all very well with hindsight to say that. But why do you think that equal pay is still so widespread when it's been a legal right for so long? I mean, it's 50 years since the passage of the Equal Pay Act this year. So why is this still happening at such a great scale? I really blame informality, although that's not really it. I think given the fact that so many promotions and the like or even pay rises happen through a conversation with your boss and letting them know that actually I've been doing quite well in these areas for the past sometimes six months. I've seen people get um, pay rises within six months. Um, And then that's how they'll be like, okay, we have the budget for that. Let's do it. You're less likely to one, have the confidence to do that if you're completely unrepresented and you don't see anyone who looks like you in the workplace and you're less likely to be received well in that instance as well. So I think the fact that so many promotions and pay rises happen in informal and um, tap on the shoulder situations that's completely puts people with protected characteristics and from unrepresented groups at a disadvantage I also blame it happening at interview stage I think asking people what their past salary was is completely inappropriate and I think it really traps particularly women um, at lower pay scales because for one your pay does not reflect your experience And it may be that you've worked at a completely different organisational setup in which you had lower pay, or perhaps you were trying a new job with different skills. And so you accepted a pay cut in that instance. And your pay should not be penalised in future jobs because of that, especially if perhaps you are a part time worker and therefore your pay was automatically lowered unless you look at it pro rata. Um, So I think asking what someone's past salary was, not showing the salary is another issue where you're just kind of leaving it to what the person knows and expects instead of being honest about They always have a budget. Employers always have a budget. So I'd say a lack of transparency and informal pay rise mechanisms are to blame. And I think that really brings us to the point of, you know, knowing that there are these high risk factors. So knowing that if you've got overlapping pay bands, if you've got a salary that, you know, you're not advertising a straight rate for, but you're advertising a range or even not advertising a salary at all. All of these factors indicate, you know, that there is a high risk attitude there towards pay equality and as you rightly say you know if you're looking at people's pay from their previous jobs you're just importing the gender pay gaps and gender bonus gaps that are already inherent in the labour market so you know it's always whenever we talk to companies and they say oh we're we're led by the market you know we we say to them well how do you justify that in terms of the law you know which which takes priority is it the market or is it the law because you have legal obligations so you know, it's really interesting to to hear that in practice. 
But do you think coronavirus has impacted how we view women's paid and unpaid work? And what's been your experience of dealing with the crisis? I absolutely think that coronavirus has altered the way that we view um, how women work and women's unpaid work, although I think that coronavirus has particularly exasperated it. Um, I think that I know this was my experience, but every woman who has children that they were watching during the school lockdowns during coronavirus was in a panic about how we were going to do our jobs, which may be full time alongside watching our children. And it's always going to go back to the discretion or the consideration of your employer and what they are able to manage at that time as well, especially when so many organisations were at risk. And it can often feel like as though the flexibility afforded to you is going to depend on the pressures on the organisation at the time. It's like that push and pull that exists in the law as well, where a flexible working request can be rejected if they can prove that there are business reasons why it would not be possible. And it can rather unavoidably, although it can be avoided to an extent, create the feeling of you being a burden on an organisation and with parenting or caring responsibilities as well, which women are more likely to have, of course, you're expected to parent as though you are not working as well. And your entire child's education during lockdown is dependent on you as a teacher and also a worker and a parent. So women were really placed in an impossible position with less educational or recreational outlets for their children and also working. I think that it made employers more aware of the things going on in their employees' lives, because you could often see it in a Zoom call background. And I think it also made women more vulnerable for that same reason, because you may be seen as less productive for those same reasons. Or if you are working remotely and it's a pandemic in which everyone knows that your child's school is closed, then that means that you may not actually be working in that moment. And that's going to be the automatic question. Or if you ask for an hour change due to not having childcare on that day or not to attend a meeting, but to still continue with your work. There's going to be scepticism with how you are received. It's just unfortunately likely and evident in organisational psychology. So women were placed in a very difficult position in this pandemic. Thanks for listening to Inequality Bites. If you're enjoying today's podcast, would you consider donating the cost of a cup of coffee or lunch to the Equality Trust? This will help us to support young people to speak truth to power, to campaign on key issues like fair and equal pay, and to produce more online content like this podcast to raise awareness of the damage that inequality causes and how we can reduce this, because inequality is not inevitable. We understand that not everyone can donate, so if you can't, then please visit our website to sign up to our mailing list, take action on our latest campaigns, and follow us on social media. Thanks for listening, and enjoy the rest of the podcast. So if you could do one thing to make working life better for women, what would you do? I suppose I would start with completely restructuring things at a senior level in organisations, because so much of a worker's experience is going to be based on the treatment they receive from their line manager or the policies and the practices in an organisation. And as we all know, these are often top down instances as the culture really changes when you when people in power behave better, as simple as that is because it sets the tone for the rest of the organisation. And ultimately, there's a power imbalance between um, managers and workers who are not in management positions. And that is how they will be. That's who they will be answering to. And that is the inequalities that will be perpetuated with more junior staff as well. So I'd say restructuring at a senior level, having women and underrepresented groups in management positions and at board positions, because it does. I don't believe in empty representation and Having diverse groups in high places does not really necessarily change things on their own, but having diverse inputs and having lived experience and having that be a contributor to organisational strategy will have a material impact on the experiences of people working in an organisation. And diversity is proven to also improve on things like return on investment. So there's a business case for it as well. So that would be the starting point for me. And what role do you think men can play in all this? Because we've we've talked about discrimination, we've talked about inequalities in terms of the workplace. And, you know, we can't avoid the subject that, let's face it, in most workplaces, men do hold far more power than women. So what can men do? Absolutely. Um, inequality is not women's work, for one. And that's something that men need to think about. Um, and I do use the word feminism. Feminism is not exclusively for women. Everyone needs to buy into it in order for it to work. Men need to be active allies, I'd say. And that doesn't just mean 
having an awareness of discrimination, acknowledging that it exists, although that's a great starting point. I feel like we too often celebrate people even acknowledging that these issues exist. I'd say that men can be open about what they're being paid, try and contribute to the transparency if it doesn't exist on an organisational published pay gap level. Discuss things with your female colleagues or um, your women colleagues who identify as women. Raise points on their behalf if that you know that they will be scrutinised for it. Back them up in the boardroom. Back them up in meetings. Don't leave the advocacy work of equality only to the people who are affected by it. Support them and work alongside them toward the goal of equality. And don't be afraid of releasing your power as well. Um, We've had amazing examples um, in the press in recent days of people who are challenging the fact that they got a pay rise when their colleague didn't or that you got a promotion when your colleague who had been there for many years longer but had a child as has been working part time was passed up for it. Even though it's scary to release power, you have to be open to it if you actually want material changes. And I think we've seen great examples of that in terms of Samira Ahmed and Kerry Gracie and very high profile women taking cases. And I think, you know, although we could argue that they're coming from a very privileged position and being able to do this, the amount of public scrutiny is still something that, you know, you or I, for example, would not would not have to have to deal with. So I think, you know, we are getting more traction in terms of public awareness of this event. But as you say, men do need to take up the slack and men need to be need to be good allies as well one of the things we're doing at the equality trust is we're we're trialing a database to try and encourage men to say what their salaries are so that women don't have to find those comparators because very often it's difficult to find a comparator and women just don't know that they're being paid less because you know we're all very british about this aren't we we don't talk about salaries we think it's vul- vulgar really to to talk about what we earn and you know meanwhile employers are able to hide behind that and what advice would you give to someone who thinks that they're being unlawfully underpaid? Firstly, um, my initial advice would be to do an evidence gathering exercise that can involve just chatting to colleagues. If there is a way, um, look through the company procedures, read the staff handbook back to front, also to protect yourself, depending on your next steps. I really, really recommend doing a subject access request because it's free and it will enable you to see at least some of the information held about you. It may not have information about your colleagues and what they are paid, but at least it will have perhaps some of the rationale behind why you are paid what you are being paid. And what that basically means is doing a request to whomever handles the data that will usually be in the privacy policy of a workplace, just saying that you are the data subject, attaching two forms of ID or one form of ID and saying what you would like to access. That may be your personnel file. It might be emails that mention you that you were not copied into And especially if it does require you to eventually escalate to legal action, that will really help you as like pre-court evidence or if in a grievance, even on a local level, that can help you. But encouraging, for example, through the HR department, asking if they're willing to release pay gap reporting, whether by ethnicity or by gender. And if they refuse, that in itself is a bad sign. You will find that many colleagues, they might not necessarily hide it, especially if you just have informal discussions with them. So unfortunately, you will often have to be a detective when you are looking into pay inequality. And it's sad when you are the one at the receiving end of this. But yeah, I'd say it's definitely worth investigating properly. And don't be afraid to take action on it because they're less likely to get away with it if we challenge it. And you're protecting others as well as yourself when you do so. And I think, you know, one of the key things is that what does stop and make somebody think they're being underpaid? Because, you know, it it does seem quite random, doesn't it? It does depend on having a conversation with somebody else or just suddenly discovering someone else is being paid. I mean, can we get to a more systematic level of, of finding these things out, I always wonder? Employers always hide behind the confidentiality excuse, but in reality, The civil service has to advertise pay bans, although what happened to me still happened in the public sector. It should be a requirement to have transparent pay scales. Um, I know that in a lot of organisations, they have to be clear about what the salary of staff members earning more than 60 grand is. But most staff members are not earning more than 60 grand and they still have an entitlement to know what they're being paid relative to their peers. I don't think we're going to be able to tackle even the tip of the iceberg, if we don't have the information to work from. It's um, the lack of transparency serves employers who are acting um, in an opaque way, let's say. I think you're absolutely right. And we know that, you know, the Fawcett Society is introducing a 
a, a bill with politicians on um, know your right so that, you know, you can you can exercise your right to know what someone else is being paid. Um, but I think, you know, we would probably go a step further at the Equality Trust and say that actually we would want transparency in all forms of salary structures. I mean, I've worked in lots of places where salary structures are, are transparent. Everybody knows more or less what people are on. Um, and what the pay grades are and what the requirements are. So it's it's really not that difficult. So it always makes me wonder that, you know, if, if, if organisations aren't doing that, then the simple question is, why aren't they doing that? At this point in the podcast, we like to ask our guests for one thing listeners can do today, one thing they can do this week, and one thing they can do this year to stand up against pay discrimination. So Sophia, what would be your advice? My advice would be, and this is advice that can go for men and women, people from all backgrounds, although I'm really gearing this towards um, people who have some level of power, is initiate conversations in your workplace and with um, the HR department, etc. People with power in your workplace have discussions about what are you being paid? What is your colleague being paid? That's how you're going to identify disparities, because they are often happening in the places where you'd least expect them in the charity sector, in the public sector, in um, roles when you're doing benevolent work, it will still happen. And you may not find out until you have those conversations. People will often say that it came as a shock to them that pay disparity was happening in their workplace. So all I can say is initiate those conversations and suss out the problem. And if you have sussed it out, then approach HR and find out if they will release transparency data. Because if there is a demand for it, then they have less reasons to refuse you. And I would add that you can speak to people about pay, obviously, and ask why pay structures and grades aren't transparent. would also recommend joining and becoming active, more importantly, in a trade union. And you can also check out our Equality Trust Potential Lifetime Earnings Loss Calculator. It is quite depressing, though, because it tells women how much they stand to lose over 45 years of working life, potentially. And this is based on the current gender pay gap at your employer. And also on the Equality Trust website is our newly launched FTSE 100 data dashboard, bringing to life the CEO pay gap, the gender pay and gender bonus gaps for the top companies. Sophia, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your personal experience and also giving some great advice to people who may think that they're being unlawfully underpaid. Thanks so much for having me today. It was a great conversation. Thanks for listening to Inequality Bites, the podcast exploring not just the damage that inequality is causing, but also the solutions, so that we can create a more equal society that's better for everyone. On our next episode, we'll be speaking to Mainaka Shanmugananta, a public policy health expert, about the relationship between inequality and mental health. As with like most ailments that manifest in, in our individual bodies, I think loneliness is a failure of our environments and the powers who have created or, or neglected them. Let us know what you thought on Twitter. Subscribe, like and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Acast or whatever platform you're listening on. And tell your friends. See you next time for Inequality Bites.